apparently I don't uh, warrant an introduction. You must all know me. Um, <clears throat> that's my name. Thank you. <clears throat> uh, got about 15 minutes, little show and tell. I'm not going to bother connecting any of the dots for you. Um, that would take another 30 minutes. But um, this uh, talk sort of has three parts. And there we go. Uh, that's a picture of me in case you can't see the real me. Um, I really want to do just three little things for you. Number one, uh, tell you what I should be doing. I took my nose off the grindstone today to, to come down here and spend time with you, and I'm enjoying it a lot. Uh, two, tell you a bunch of stuff that I did do. It's all 20 years old, ancient history. But you know what? It's kind of interesting to look at Moore's Law in the rearview mirror. Stuff happened. Some of it came true beyond our wildest dreams. Some of it face-planted before it got to the runway. Some of it has yet to come true. It was all interesting. And then in the last little bit, I've got um, kind of a couple of thoughts about ideas and creating the conditions that allow ideas to be nurtured and allow them to grow. Um, so let's just plunge right in. The thing I should be doing uh, is this. I actually run a conference that does not have the word TED in the name. I know it's strange to think of a conference, but there's another one. It's called EG. It's in a couple of weeks, so I'm kind of going crazy nailing jello to wall. Uh, but it's a very special conference, and as with this gathering, um, I think all of these things are important because um, they're not just about ideas, they're about people who make ideas real. And having an idea is a lot easier than bringing it to reality. Um, our version of, uh, of a conference is focused on people who make and do wonderful things in all fields, and we have a silly fun time designing the program books. One year we turn people into vintage circus posters. There's Peter Diamandis. Um, last year it was retro sci-fi, uh, which I thought was kind of a nice hook for some of what I'm going to show you. There's Jack Horner, the world's foremost dinosaur authority, and uh, Tom Gruber, who wrote Siri at Apple. People who make stuff, people who do stuff. And I really think the act of making and doing things is the salvation of our crumbling society. It, it has to be. It, as someone commented over lunch, creation is the opposite of destruction. Uh, but it takes more than just ideas. It takes a lot of discipline, a lot of focus. This, by the way, is the program book for the upcoming conference. Wouldn't you like to look inside and see what design hack we've got this year? Well, I'm not going to show you, but what I do want to do is just flash back about 20 years. So it's uh, 1986. I had just started as a graduate student at MIT, um, but uh, dropped out. No sooner had I dropped in and moved to this house in Woodside, California. It was built by Daniel Jackling, who was the great American copper baron in the 19-teens, 20s, 30s, a fantastically wealthy man because Ma Bell needed a lot of copper pulled over the country. And he built this glorious old romantic Spanish mission house. Um, and so I moved in there. My favorite feature was the house organ. It had four keyboards uh, and a bonus. It had not one but two pneumatic player mechanisms and a whole bunch of punched paper rolls for things like Wagner overtures. I can actually recognize those dots. That's the ride of the Valkyries. But you'd fire this thing up, and it would rattle the tiles and knock them loose from the roof. Fantastic thing. Um, my roommate was Steve Jobs. And this was 1986. Steve and I lived together in that house, just a couple of barefoot bachelors setting each other up on blind dates. Uh, and we were starting a company at the time. Steve, by the way, wasn't very interested in furniture. He had a lamp. Uh, and uh, a bunch of vinyl LPs that he never played, as far as I could tell. Uh, that's the house from the air, and sadly, the house is now gone, and even more sadly, uh, my friend Steve is gone. Uh, but here's what we dreamed of creating, the next computer. How many of you bought a next computer back in the late Bronze Age? Anybody? Oh, you're also L.A. Um, <laughs> nobody here is from William Morris? Come on. <laughs> Uh, this was a dream machine for universities. It was filled with every treasure, every wonder we could think of putting in the hands of scholars. That particular one I was kind of proud of. We sent it to Switzerland, and it was owned by Tim Berners-Lee. He built the World Wide Web on that very computer. These were the specs. I'm not sure if these numbers mean much anymore. It's hard to imagine a computer cranking along at 25 megahertz these days. And all of that was just $6,500. So flash forward ahead. Uh, these are the numbers. Uh, you know, the miracles have happened. iPhone, supercomputer in your pocket, 50 times faster, 100 times more capacity, a 30th the price, and all people can do is bitch about the Apple Maps. Well, fuck you. <laughs> I mean, fuck you. <clears throat> 
while we were doing all that next stuff, I was sort of running this stir fry of nutty research projects at the MIT Media Lab. And in those days, as the digital world was sort of erupting into a renaissance, this was the red light district of science. Um, and I'm just going to show you a whole bunch of crap. Uh, some of it you might recognize, other of it you won't. Um, my fantasy, I wanted dancing shoes. Shoes that would teach you how to dance like Fred Astaire and actually you know, move your feet in the right position. Those shoes actually responded. They didn't move your feet. Um, that was a weird one. Joe Pompey is the inventor of holographic audio. It's an ultrasonic speaker array. You put it near your ear, you can't hear anything. But it turns out you can focus those sound waves, and when they merge at a fixed point that you've set, they form an audible signal. And it's a lot of fun. You stand up on the fourth floor of a building, you point it down on the shoulders of some unsuspecting professor, and he hears the rudest things whispered in his ear, and wonders, you know, where is it coming from? <laughs> They thought it wouldn't work. Uh, we spent years combining technology and toys. Uh, very proud of all this stuff. Among other things, our teams invented Lego Mindstorms, which is a fusion of kind of computing and information with construction toys. But when you step back and take a bigger look, toys are the spark plugs for your imagination. You're never more creative than when you play. You have your best ideas when you play. You make your best connections with your best friends. You learn your best lessons. And when you all grew up, toys were mostly wood, metal, and plastic and the odd video game. But more and more, these toys will have super duper computers in them, iPhone++, connected to the whole fabric of everything else. And you know what? If we fuck them up, we will have destroyed one of the most important parts of life, not just for our children, but for ourselves. So there's a lot that needs to be learned about that. Um, we had a, a kind of renegade hockey team, and one of the kids on the team started a company called Color Kinetics, invented LED lighting, and uh, that turned out to be a good idea. Uh, <laughs> all these things, in fact, this screen is an LED screen, and I believe it's one that our engineers at Color Kinetics designed. But at the laboratory, we just used it to make disco effects and, and well, long story, but, you know, <laughs> LEDs worked, and you should still invest because it's just the beginning. Um, Domestic infrastructures. We had refrigerators that knew what magnets were pinned to them, microwaves that scanned all the crap you were putting in them. This was a favorite one of mine, though. It was the first scratch and sniff computer. Uh, <clears throat> and it, there was a little smell synthesizer, so when you poked a rose, you smelled a rose. When you poked an infant, you smelled infant-oriented smells. Uh, but there's an interesting and beguiling question there. Text has ASCII and Unicode. <clears throat> Audio has samples. Pictures have pixels. Once you have a code that's manipulable and the ability to sort of take in and spit out information in that form, the world changes. And you can sort of look back and see computers as they went from being teletypes to CD players to digital cameras. But we don't yet have computers that are olfactory, that can smell and can generate smells. But someday we will, you mark my words, and then the world will be really creepy. Uh, when we got our first laser cutter, and I was glad to see them turning up at retail places in New York, um, we just used it in the kitchen because, you know, like Ronco, these things slice and dice at 600 DPI. Uh, one of the things we got a kick out of was, you know, the obvious, printing the stock ticker, reporting your toast. And, um, <laughs> but my favorite was you'd pick up these vegetables, and the tomato would have a fragment of a recipe on it and some dotted lines. You'd say, slice me on these dotted lines and then see my friend the green pepper for the next step. It was like object-oriented cooking. And so the students actually jimmied up a kitchen countertop, loaded it with sensors. The thing would recognize what ingredients were down there, what gestures you were going through. It would talk you through a recipe, different from a cookbook, different from a Julia Child rerun on television. This was an immersive sort of full-on kitchen. Uh, and they came up with a cute name for this. It's, it's worth a tiny story. We called it counterintelligence. And I've always thought that Seinfeld was right when he said, you know, uh, uh, names matter. If you name your kid Jeeves, there's a good chance he'll grow up to be a butler. Um, <coughs> counterintelligence rang bells, and we started getting calls from everybody who wanted to join our laboratory as a sponsor. They just thought it was cool to be part of MIT's counterintelligence initiative. Go figure. Well, one day, I get a call from a guy who says, Professor, I work for a very large agency in the Washington area, and uh, me and my uh, colleagues here at the NSA, we take counterintelligence very seriously. And I said, I'm sure you do. You know, we do at MIT. And he said, well, the fact is there's not a lot of you university types doing research in counterintelligence, so we'd very much like to sponsor your program. One of my men will be in touch. And he hangs up the phone. The next call 
swear to God, was from this guy who said, Professor, I'm from the CIA, and I've been reading about your counterintelligence operation. I said, look, pal, uh, I don't mean to embarrass you, but, you know, the NSA, they're always a step or two ahead of you guys, aren't they? <laughs> I mean, it must really burn your bacon. They came to sponsor, and he said, no, 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 you don't understand, Professor. I come from the Culinary Institute of America. We train chefs. We're very interested in the future of media in the kitchen, blah, blah, blah. Um, roller skates with things in them and wireless networks to tell you how you're rollerblading. We built the same stuff on bikes and the graduate students for a, uh, and it's interesting, by the way, this was just the moment in, in history where you could put computing on a bike and record everything, the GPS, the bio data, the weather, all of it, and not encumber the riders. Computers had just gotten small enough. And so for their final exam, the kids rode 3,000 miles across the country. Uh, we were then approached by Lance Armstrong, who wanted our engineers to sort of figure out how to help him ride faster. We didn't do that. <laughs> uh, turns out he didn't need our help. Uh, we did have a failed IMAX project. I just liked it because of the name. It was about cycling, and it was called Wheel Life. Um, we started putting stuff on people without wheels. Uh, we were the first uh, humans to run a marathon with all sorts of sensors. There's a pill that you swallow that measures your internal body temperature, chips in your shoes. In those days, it was a novelty. Nowadays, if you run a marathon, there's a chip in your shoe, in every shoe, to capture the timings. Totally straightforward. Um, this was a skidometer in Iceland. Why did we do this? Why did we go to Iceland in January? Answer, the plane tickets are really cheap. Nobody goes to Iceland in the middle of January. Uh, but the skidometer told you how fast and how far you went across cross-country skis. Try building one of those. It turns out it's not so easy, and it, it still isn't exactly bread and butter. Um, by the way, uh, in northern Norway, where these were taken, we learned that they don't have mountains. Instead of mountains, they just buckle themselves to the back of a reindeer, which we know moves at exactly 63 kilometers per hour because our skis figured it out. Um, we built stuff in jewelry. Uh, this was a beautifully designed Harry Winston brooch, 56 perfect diamonds, six rubies, gold and platinum setting. Can be yours for $500,000. But the rubies glow with every heartbeat, and there's a little signaler that kicks it online. One of the interesting things about all that stuff is that none of these modalities have been fused yet. The whole industry of magic little goobers on your wrist that tell you whether you're sleeping enough or running enough, that is an industry that's kind of waiting for its Steve Jobs. It's something that has so much potential for humanity, but it, it hasn't had the kind of backing that the personal computer business has had. Um, we got a hold of some embroidery machines and hacked around with those. Uh, conductive thread, it turns out you can stitch circuitry in clothing. We did that. We were upset with the way embroidery machines worked. There were half a dozen stupid threads. The things would break when they changed color, so we fixed that. We replaced it with one thread that goes through and an inkjet sprayer. It's called dye on the fly. You squirt the right color on the thread. It's exactly the color you need when it hits the cloth. Problem solved. You know, move on. <laughs> uh, uh, let's skip all this crap. Uh, first people to do digital photography with um, interesting GPS, invented a bunch of stuff like photo mosaics. Who knew? Turned out to be a graduate student thesis because we could. For instance, Abraham Lincoln made entirely out of Matthew Brady's photographs from the Civil War. We printed out 20,000 of those, sent them to every elementary school in the country. We didn't tell them, though, that John Wilkes Booth is hiding right up there in the temple, sort of near where the exit wound is. Anyway, still too soon, OK. Um, we did uh, expeditions, a whole vein of expeditionary research. Uh, this was recalculating the summit height of Everest. That's exposed bedrock on the Nepal side. Turned out GPS, even before selective availability was turned off, would get you to within a spherical millimeter. And it turns out, because the Indian subcontinent is tectonically shoving north, every year Nepal takes over another smidgen of China without killing anybody. Um, so we wired up climbers to monitor their bio data, did weather sensing, telemetry. Here's some knucklehead bringing a wheelchair up to base camp. That's a real cheerful sign. There's no place to push a wheelchair. It's all boulders. Uh, we, on the other hand, brought all our electronics and soldering irons and power. So we were the most popular base camp installation up there. Um, our photography stuff erupted in Bhutan, a beautiful little Shangri-La country. We shanghaied young Bhutanese children, gave them ridiculously expensive digital cameras, photographed 100,000 images that cover the whole of that lovely kingdom, published a book. It turned out to be a large book. Um, it turned out to be the biggest book, actually. In fact, I called Jeff Bezos when we produced it, and I said, Jeff, I think you really can be the world's largest bookseller. And he said, I already am. I said, no, 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 I mean literally. 
Um, and by the way, that was all done before Google Maps. It was done before Google was founded. So uh, there were a lot of blank places in the world that you had to plunge off to without the benefit of search and, and pinpoint advertising. Um, science fiction was tagged in the title of this, and I just want to get um, to the close here. Um, Alex McDowell, who's in the room, and his uh, partner, Steven Spielberg, contacted us at the Media Lab and say, hey, we're doing a Philip Dick movie called Minority Report. What do you got? And we just sent them a student. It's uh, always easiest that way. Get rid of another student, make room for the next one. The student we sent them was John Undercoffler. He's now got a company here in LA called Oblong. Uh, what happened, essentially, was uh, Raytheon saw Tom Cruise yanking holograms out of thin air. And they called up and they ordered one of those systems. And John said, you're joking, right? I mean, it's a movie. Hello? <laughs> and they said, well, how much would it take to actually build that? So John started a company and has done that. Um, all those words are attached to these things. Many of them are sort of real words. Some of them are still science fiction. Um, this is the point that I began with. And uh, here are my two little closures for you. One is, is my favorite MacGuffin, and it has to do with the conditions that allow ideas to blossom. And then two is just a metaphor that I think is very helpful to keep in mind. I was just talking with Ken backstage, who reminded me that uh, my dear friend Nicholas Negroponte has always said you can't overhype the importance of what's going on. And he's right. Um, here's the, uh, the MacGuffin. Uh, it's the Antikythera mechanism. Anybody know about this? It's one of the greatest archaeological bloopers of all time. Um, it's a 2,000-year-old hunk of rust that did amazingly sophisticated astronomical computations using clever, clever gears. Only in the last 10 years have they deconvolved the mechanism by using x-rays to sort of slice through the innards, as you can see here. This was clockwork 1,000 years before anybody built a clock with gears. And interestingly, no device like this had ever been found that predates it. Um, 60 BC, what happened? Well, what happened was amazing. And by the way, what it did was it tracked the positions of the five planets that were known. It gave you the phase of the moon. It was accurate to a quarter of a day per year. It took into account leap years. The gearing captured the eccentricities of orbits of things like the moon and the planets, which don't go in a circle. They go in an ellipse. It's an incredibly clever device. So Julius Caesar organized a kind of World's Fair or a TED conference or whatever the hell it was in ancient Rome. <laughs> and, uh, a ship set sail from Rhodes, carrying one of Archimedes' treasures. It crashed at point A off of Antikythera. It was not found for 2,000 years. Some divers found it around 1900. There's a long story, many documentaries about it. But the point is, it's an incredible seat. I mean, this thing could have been dropped here by some alien race. And tragically, it never made it to Rome. Actually, it's not quite that tragic, because it did make it to Rome. It turns out that there was a centurion who took out his sword, and he chopped Archimedes in half. And he took out of Archimedes' laboratory all the shiniest objects he could find, and two of them were Antikythera mechanisms. He brought them back to Rome, and they sat on his mantelpiece. And the reason we know this is because Cicero visited the home of his grandson, who had inherited this crap, and it just sat there like objet d'art. You know, it was all in Greek, so the Romans didn't know what it meant. It, seeds that had fallen on fallow ground. It could have transformed science and thinking about the universe and engineering and everything else, had it been known for what it was. Instead, what happened? You had to wait for the Greek Empire to collapse, then the Roman Empire to collapse. The technology and know-how trickled up through the Muslim world. It took 800 years before the first astrolabes with metal and toothed gears started turning up. That's a tragedy, I think. We could have saved ourselves a millennium or two. Um, just, I mean, think about that, because no matter how conditioned your world is to absorb ideas and make them go, there are always challenges. There are always people who want to just cut you in half and stick something on the mantle. Metaphor. Um, this is not a very pretty picture. I apologize, but whatever. An obese German alcoholic guy in his skivvies. Uh, Martin Strell is his name. Ring a bell? Uh, he likes to swim, it turns out. Here's Martin in his element. Um, <coughs> his element is actually the biggest rivers in the world. This is the man who swam the Amazon. Uh, he didn't swim the falls, but uh, as you know, the Amazon Basin is ginormous. I mean, this thing gushes out one-fifth of all the fresh water on Earth. It's fresh water that gets shot out with such force that the estuary is 250 miles long and 200 miles out in sea. Sailors have known for several centuries 
that you can be without the sight of land, but dip your cup in the water, and it comes out fresh water in the ocean that you can drink. That's how much water is gushing out of the Amazon. And that's the metaphor. Um, when the digital world meets our infinitely rich and interesting analog world, everything changes. You rethink everything. And tiny little companies like Google and Apple are all chewing on their own little sort of parts of the problem. But they're only little bits. They're only little blips. And uh, there's plenty of room for more invention, more innovation. So um, I think with that, I've overrun my time a couple of minutes. But uh, it's nice to think about wacky ideas that might someday have a chance to turn into reality. So thanks very much. <laughs> <laughs>